Uh, am I coming through all right? Awesome. Thanks, guys. <clears throat> okay. I'll, I'll monitor the uh, participation room here to see when people join us, but I think we're just about to get ready. We're going to get started. And so, uh, so we're off. So guys, first and foremost, thank you so much for, for joining me here on this uh, on this webinar. Uh, we're really excited. We just actually wrapped up this Burr project uh, not long ago, and we've got the place humming. It's uh, being rented out, and uh, you know we're going through the stabilization phase, which is always a very exciting phase uh, when you do a large project like this. So I'm excited to get into some nuts and bolts. Um, towards the end, we're going to have an opportunity to um, to uh, have some questions answered for you guys. So if you guys want to delve into anything in specific, um, of course, we'd, I'd love to, to share some more insights with you. So I'll stick around afterwards as well. And uh, and worst case, you guys can always reach out to us after and we can, we'd can we be more than happy to facilitate like a one-on-one -on -one phone call. In fact, we encourage it if this is something that, that interests you. So very briefly, my name is Alex Powell. I'm with Powell Property Solutions. Um, my wife, Kaylee, and I, um, we are real estate investors. We do property management where we have our licenses and we do transact real estate as well. We do larger renovations. We've done all sorts of renos from multi-unit conversions. We've done commercial to residential conversions. We've done all kinds of additions on properties, you name it. Um, and we're very passionate about educating people, especially about real estate. We are incredibly passionate about it ourselves. We've seen the benefits of what real estate has had to offer for us and our family. And uh, we now see the benefits, what happens when you know our partners as families are influenced or when we see other people who are uh, uh, you know doing it for themselves and see the, the light of it. So something that very much excites us. Um, our experience currently, we have just under 80 units that we're managing right now that are our own. Um, it's about $22 million worth of real estate right now. Uh, we do specialize in buy and hold and burr type uh, properties, but we have done some awesome flip projects. One of them we actually made the news for because it was such a major overhaul. And uh, we've also now expanded. We've started to buy properties in outside provinces like New Brunswick. Uh, we have an apartment building out there, which we have never seen to this day, and it is running beautifully. It just makes me super happy. And we've also uh, incorporated and moved into the U.S. So we just actually bought our second property in Columbus, Ohio, which we're really, really excited about. But going back to today's topic, we are talking about the Burr strategy on an apartment building. So for those of you guys who don't know, the Burr stands for Buy, Renovate, Rent Out, Refinance, Repeat. And it's just an acronym to... Um, uh, to kind of shorten it up. And it's, it's coined its phrase quite successfully, especially over the last few years when you've had such incredible appreciation uh, in, in property values. So uh, the Burr strategy, the reason I like it is that you kind of get to have your cake and eat it too. Uh, you can buy a property that's undervalued, that's not operating correctly. It might need a lot of work. So you can buy it at a favorable price. You put the effort and the work into it to raise the property value higher and when you refinance the property, you can often recoup all your money. We've recouped surpluses in the six figures on Burr properties while the property is still cash flowing. So we own it. We've gotten paid money out and it cash flows still. So imagine getting paid six figures to own a cash flowing asset. It's awesome. So like anything, you know, scaling is a challenge. It's scary at first when you start getting into it. This is uh, not our first apartment, but this was a very successful burr strategy that we did. Uh, and so this is what we're going to be sharing with you guys here. So this is kind of a before and after. I, I went through my my picture Rolodex or whatever today to see. <laughs> Honestly, I couldn't find any good exterior pictures. But hopefully here you guys can tell that, like, you know, we have done some extra your windows we've paved the place so it's a it's a it's looking really bright fresh and 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 good so I'll tell you guys how we got started in this so we have a uh, a landscape uh, landscaper who has a, a landscape company 
something. And he actually had a friend of, of his that had acquired a property or was in the process of acquiring a property. However, it seemed that he was going to ne- need some support. So actually just through word of mouth, we were talking on one of our projects and he's like, you know what, I should really connect you with my buddy. You know, he'd be looking to collaborate on a potential opportunity that he has. So, you know, I'm, I'm never one to turn down a, an opportunity. So we actually met at his place. And I will say um, there are people that end up j- coming into your life uh, that you know will be around for a long time. And the partner that we partnered on with this property, I'm super grateful that he has not only turned into a, a sensational business partner, but at this point, someone I really trust and I, I hope to be very good friends with for many years to come, which I think is just one of the most awesome things, especially when you're you know, making mistakes, having fun, making money together. You know, it's, a, it's good to have a very good relationship with a partner. So when we got this property, when I went to go look at it, so this property was actually a student rental. And at the time, uh, well, prior to the owner that we bought it from, it was actually managed beautifully. The place was kept up to not uh, top notch. It was beautifully kept. And the current owners completely um, negated the fact that you know, students were the ones that should predominantly be occupying this property. And in an effort just to get more people to come through, they ended up renting the place out to some riffraff that unfortunately chased out all of the students. Lo and behold, time passed and the property just ended up bringing in more and more undesirable tenants, let's call them. There's a tremendous amount of drug activity uh, in the building. Uh, the property was known for a violent crime all over the place i've like i'll tell you some stories as we get into it but there were overdose deaths in this building um the police all knew the building like the second you you mentioned 35 niagara their ears all perked up because everyone knew the property and what was wrong with the property and what they had to deal with with the property so regardless that's where it was now the owners that we bought it from they had good intentions they they thought to themselves and in it's actually a little bit heartbreaking to to kind of see it but they created this facebook uh this facebook group for this property and they were encouraging uh safe drug usage so their thought was as the property was kind of spiraling downhill they were going to encourage people that they could maybe help and they were looking for community outreach and support and you would see through their posts, it was like a storyboard of their experiences as time passed on of, oh, someone stole all the copper from the bathroom, or, you know, there was another fire in one of the bedrooms, or we just had another overdose death, or, you know, there was a fight that broke up and whatever. And by the end of it, the property was so there, there was not running water in the place. You couldn't Turn, you didn't know which light to turn on. You didn't know which circuit was going to blow up in your face or spark. And so effectively, they just needed to get rid of it. So after we um, went and took a look at it, obviously, this place needed a complete and total overhaul uh, in order to get this project to its completion. So a bit of viewer discretion, uh, unfortunately, and it's not something I particularly enjoy sharing these pictures. I think it's actually quite sad. And it breaks my heart a little bit that this is kind of, this actually happens in today's society. I know a lot of us kind of live away from these kind of, this this lens, I guess you could call it. Um, but the condition of the property was like, I've never seen any before in my life. So um, once again, the one thing I will say is that the majority of the people, actually all of the people that had lived in this building at the time of acquisition were actually not tenants. And that's the craziest thing to me is that nobody had a right to be living here. They just kind of came and if they found a mattress, they would find a, a place to to store themselves. And that was it. And it was uh, crazy to see that some of the conditions of the place, but I, I have a little bit of a video here. I'm gonna I'm not going to watch the whole thing, but I'll kind of give you guys an idea. This is already once the property had started to be um, cleared out. So you can kind of see the, the, the layout a little bit of, you know, the, you go down the hallway, there's a couple rooms on either side. And once again, there's rooms that, you know, have nothing. They've ripped the walls apart to get to wiring. You know, they took the appliances apart. Um, uh, there was no, no copper in the building. 
Uh, you couldn't find an ounce of copper to save your life. But unfortunately, um, with that, you know, it's you only really have one option. You kind of have to start from scratch when you don't know what's functioning anymore. It's not like certain properties that we end up buying. It's like, you know what, we could probably salvage the copper or, you know what, this this uh, electrical seems to like it would be in okay shape, you know, or, you know, we can redo this or whatever. But this kind of gives you an idea, a little bit of the layout of the property. Uh, and especially in the condition that it was in being a, a, a boy or rooming house, perfect for student rentals. And the way it was set up, it had three kitchens, one on each floor. And it would have been just such a perfect student rental, to be honest with you. And, um, but unfortunately we had to, uh, we had to make a decision as to what direction we would want to take this property. And so we had to, to change things up a little bit. So it brings me to our plan. So in this property, we had actually gotten this property under contract for $750,000 and the seller agreed to a half a million dollar vendor take back at 3%. Now this is before interest rates had really skyrocketed. So at the time it was, oh, you know, it was good. It kind of helped us out with the financing side of things. We didn't have to go and pursue our own financing. So vendor take back was always a wise decision if that's the case, you know, it just allows a lot less paperwork to, to go through. But the big thing was due to the stigmatization of the property. So you imagine this property has been the, the center focus of drug activity for the past you know, couple of years. Uh, people are dealing drugs from there. There's a lot of violent crime that happens. During the time where we had uh, gotten it under contract and prior to closing, we hadn't even closed on the deal yet. There was, I think, two overdose deaths in the building, and one lady had to get helicopter lifted to uh, Mac Hospital uh, here in Hamilton because of just the, uh, I think she got stabbed or something like that. I'm not 100% sure, but it was a uh, police tape everywhere. The next morning when we got called in to go to the, the building, it was a little surreal. So the going back to it, where most of the tenants actually in this building weren't uh, legally able to occupy the place. They were just randoms. We actually had to work with local law enforcement to clear these people out. You know, it was on, on you know, there's the pro and con of this whole thing is that, you know, like often when you're dealing with tenants that have legitimate rights to be there and it's in the same situation, you're subject to dealing with the landlord tenant board where you're waiting this process. But I mean, these were just squatters, literally five cop cars showed up and they were just, they blitzed the building. It was like nothing I've ever seen before. Um, kind of wish that that could happen more often, to be honest with you. But it did make the whole process of the, I guess, the eviction, you want to call it, a little bit simpler. And as soon as that happened, we had crews there boarding up all the walls, all the windows, getting things buttoned up. And then it was just a matter of monitoring because for the next few weeks after that, people were still just trying to rip off the plywood to get in. So here was our plan financially. So we're going to buy this building for $750,000. We're estimating we're going to be about $600,000 in renovations here because literally we're having to start from the ground up. I'm talking new windows. We need a new roof. We need new plumbing. We need new everything. So total in, we're looking, we're going to be about 1.35 million all in on this deal. Now we're projecting after it's going to be all done. So our ARV, our after repair value is going to be coming in at approximately 1.8 million. So if that's the case. And if we can actually get a, you know, 70% loan to value mortgage from uh, the bank, you know, through a CMHC type mortgage. And at $1.26 million, we'd still have a little bit of money left in the deal. But the way that a return on investment works, despite the fact that we still have money in the deal, the less money that we have in the deal, the higher our return on investment shoots up. And that's okay. I mean, nowadays with interest rates being as high as they are and with property values, you know, uh, being now as high as they have been, these conversion projects during that ramp up of 2020, 2021, 2021, 2022, you could do these burrs and just pull up massive surpluses. Nowadays, they're a little less, um, they're a little less frequent, I would say, to be able to get a perfect burr, as they call it. So perfect burrs when Every penny that you put into a property, you've pulled out every single dollar or every single penny that you you have, and you're retaining the asset in whatever shape or form you've you, or whatever terms you put together. Okay, 
So in this situation, we'd be leaving a little bit of cash in the deal. However, we had a really strong projected monthly cash flow, which is something that is very challenging once again to find, especially here in Southern Ontario with property values and rents. So I think that this was going to be an awesome deal. Let's, let's delve into it, right? So we had a couple of challenges. Now, I could probably sit on this, uh, on this uh, webinar for the next you know, three hours and talk about challenges, but in the effort to respect all your guys' time, and I know we're all looking for like the Coles Notes version, I wanted to just talk a little bit about some of the higher level challenges, three in particular. One of them was the permit process. So we had to go for minor variance. I've been to a ton of minor variances before, or been through a ton of them before. And for some reason, this entire permit process was an absolute nightmare. Um, we were dealing with the city of St. Catharines and, uh, now that the permits closed and I don't have to suck up to anybody anymore, it was a colossal mess dealing with the city. We had one guy who retired halfway through. Um, and so all of his correspondence happened to be misplaced. So then they had to send it to another person who had a bunch of these weird questions. We were constantly going back and forth with them. It was a unanimous vote from the committee. So that didn't actually hinder anything, but then, you know, they have to pull in this person to ask questions about something. Plus the Niagara Escarpment Commission wants to, you know, have their two cents into it too. So, I mean, 15 months to do a simple conversion project, in my opinion, is bonkers. However, it is what it is, and we got through it. But And not just that, but we've gotten to a point as well where when we're in this, in this waiting period, we're not going to sit idle. We're going to kind of do as much as we can until the city tells us to stop. And realistically, you can only do so much until you have to get an inspector to prove it anyway. So, for example, you can make headway with framing. You can make headway with plumbing and electrical and these kind of things without having, like, you technically need to get a permit first, but you're not really hiding things uh, because you're not drywalling. So before you put drywall up or before you insulate, if you call the the inspectors, usually they come through and be like, ah, you're supposed to call us for demo. And we always just ask forgiveness, not permission at that point. So probably not the best way to do it. So don't take that as as a way to, you know, as clear cut notes. But anyway, that's how we like to do it because it saves us time. Mind you, in this project, we held off on electrical till the very, very last second because we were not going to risk having a bunch of valuable copper lying around this place while you know people are sniffing around. So 15 months, however, for a permit process, in my opinion, is why people aren't building in, in Ontario right now. And uh, they got to really change this up because this building sat vacant for two years during a housing crisis. Anyway, here we have a another issue that I thought was totally unwarranted or uncalled for. We had a one and a quarter inch water line going in through uh, going to the building. And so this property, if if you can imagine, there's a four lane highway. It's a regional road there on Niagara Street. And to our our curb shutoff was actually at the other side of the highway. Um, so we actually had to bring it forward right into the, uh, right to the front of the building. But the way it was all set up was actually very odd. Um, regardless, we had to get a permit from not just the city of St. Catharines, but we also had to get a permit from the city of Niagara Falls to go ahead and do this. It required a whole separate engineering design. And not to mention that upgrading the water line was, I think we were like one fixture that we just couldn't shave off. There, it was like the bare minimum. We were going to tell them that we weren't going to put laundry units in and and uh, you know afterwards we just put laundry in anyway we had engineers confirm and write reports saying guys we feel the water pressure is more than adequate here you know based on these studies but unfortunately based on what their minimum code requirements were we were just under the threshold and so we had to upgrade to a two inch line i, I think that the difference between like a a one and a half or two inch line. I, I just, I don't think that they did one. There was some reason we had to jump up to the next level, but um, anyway, we have to go with a much larger line. And now you could probably like anyone who's showering in that place can probably take off the first layer of skin on them. So it's a uh, very therapeutic, I'm sure. But one thing I can tell you is doing this is super expensive. This water line upgrade alone. I mean, we were getting quotes at the beginning for like, $80,000 to upgrade a stupid water line. Anyway, we ended up um, kind of 
combining our efforts and and uh, my partner actually really came through on this portion of it uh he was more of the civil guy in the in the project whereas i was kind of more of the electrical mechanical guy which actually really complemented each other especially during a project like this um, but he ended up mustering resources that he had on hand and i think that we did it for about half that but still you know you can you can appreciate that that does a quite a number on your budget uh, when you're not expecting it so the, the last real big considering um, uh, issue that we always were facing throughout the project was just constant break-ins, constant vandalism. Uh, you know, the, the property, understandably, when it's going through a stabilization period, when a lot of people are used to going there to grab whatever drugs they want to pick up or, you know, that's, that's where they feel comfortable to, to hunker down for the evening you kind of have to destigmatize that. And we did that by obviously boarding up the outside and we put fencing up along the back of the property as well. Um, but still, you know, you go there, we had new windows installed that were boarded up. And next thing you know, you have a, a, a crack in two of the windows. I mean, we had rocks thrown through our second story windows. Um, we also had a garage at the back of the property. Now that garage was like a detached one car garage. We got a call one evening in the middle of the night from the fire department. And I guess two drug addicts had climbed in there and decided to smoke crack in the middle of the night and burnt our entire garage down to the ground. And the fire department called us and blasted my partner and I and threatened us that if it wasn't cleaned up in 24 hours, that they would be fining us. And it was just like, it was a very odd moment to have just the lack of support, I guess, from the city when they hopefully would have recognized that we're trying to do something good and clean up this this place every neighbor around the area was like like moses trying to part the water so that we could go and do what we had to do if we needed to use water if we needed power if we needed anything they would be right there helping us and and in turn it was actually it's good to have neighbors like that that you can you can lean on like they needed to store a bin on our parking lot one time we helped them out right but for some reason, the city just never sees it that way. I don't know if you guys have had experiences with the city of St. Catharines. I'd, I'd love to hear how you guys made out. But anyway, so all this said and done, um, you know, there's obviously challenges that happen throughout the process. You know, you go into like especially fire rating larger buildings it can get a little bit challenging and you kind of have to walk through it gently but all in all when you're doing something like this by the time you get down to the bare studs and you're kind of starting over it's all pretty straightforward it's like doing a duplex or anything like that it's it's just your your budget increases because you have to times it by x amount of units and um and that's what makes it a little bit more challenging when you're you know doing a project like this is just the budget side of things and then managing all the budget aspects so after two years, this is the real reveal that we got. So we got beautiful one bedroom apartments, kind of open concept. Kind of take a look. We decided to go with just laminate countertops in this case, but we stuck with the stainless steel appliances and we put a dishwasher in each of the units as well. Nice backsplashes. So we did actually get engineered hardwood. Um, we actually got a dynamite deal from like a wholesaler on engineered hardwood that was cheaper than any other wood that we would have wanted to put in. Now this engineered hardwood, I think is like three eighths hardwood. It's not your, your real thick stuff, but still, I mean, the, you can sand it and you can refinish it. I think up to two times or something like that. So it's pretty, pretty sweet. Here's the bathroom layout, really spacious, big, lots of cabinet space for storage. Here's the bedroom as well with closets behind it. We did wire in like uh, internet cables and 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 TV cables for in all the units as well. So you don't have spaghetti all over the exterior of the building. Here's another unit kind of layout as well. Um, so side note, in this picture, you don't see it, but right here, this is after the photos are done. We're all done and we're getting our, our fire inspection on this property. And the fire marshal came in and and decided to do a sound test for the um, for the what's it called the uh, uh, the horns. So in in apartment buildings, when you're walking down the corridor, you'll see these red things on the on the, the close to the ceiling, usually mounted on the wall, and they call those horns. And so, if in the case of a fire, that horn will go off in the hallway, and it'll it'll wake up every tenant so that they understand you know, that there's a fire and they can evacuate the building safely. And that also happens when you pull the pool station for the fire alarm, these kind of things. Now, he went into the bedroom 
and he put the phone theoretically where the pillow would be of a person, and he did a decibel retest, and he found that the hallway strobes didn't hit the decibel levels required from the hallway into the bedroom, and it was off by like five or six decibels. Regardless, he made us put <laughs> horns in each of the unit suites, and that was a $16,000 unforeseen right after everything's been done we've got staging here and guys are climbing clamoring all over the place but lo and behold once again if there is ever a fire you sure as hell know that that person will be sh- jumping out of bed because the horn will be right outside their bedroom uh, for every single unit so anyway that's just a little gripe on my end but turned out beautifully the, the units are, are exceptional we've got um had a lot of really good feedback from them as well. And, and they're easy to rent, which I think is great. Despite the stigmatized area, despite the whole kind of block where it is slowly turning over, there's another project that's happening right beside ours and another project that's going to be happening kitty corner to ours too. And we've seen the plans for some of these buildings and they are drop dead gorgeous. They're just com- completely going to change the entire atmosphere of this block. And uh, so we're glad to have kind of led the, a renaissance to a certain extent um charging through the slush, slush a little bit here but we're, we're super excited about that so as a final result our budget went over now not surprisingly we were kind of stuck in that whole covid mess too so uh you know despite that we had like contingency in there it just got eaten up so quickly and lo and behold, we were up another $100,000 waterline upgrade, for example. These things all added up to, uh, to amount to a little bit more than what we had initially expected. So we were in it for about 1.45. But the best part of all this now, of course, time, uh, you know, time in the market, not timing the market. In this situation, even with interest rates having gone up, our appraisal came in at 2.25. You know, so this was like four hundred thousand dollars more, over four hundred thousand dollars, what we initially anticipated, and so which was great. That's super exciting. But remember now, in commercial uh, real estate, it's different than in residential. In residential, if my appraisal comes in at you know two million dollars, the bank will say, "Oh, as long as you qualify, we'll get you eighty percent loan to value." So in so if you can afford the debt service that's going to be on that property, they'll approve you as long as the appraisal matches. It's all kind of one-on-one. The difference is in commercial is that the property has to carry the debt themselves. Now imagine a situation where interest rates have gone up. Now the property may be valued at more, which is fantastic. That gives the, the bank, the lender, kind of a warm and fuzzy that Okay, these guys, this value is good. However, because the interest rates had climbed as much as they did, they only wanted to give us 65% loan to value. So, you know, in comparison, we only got 1.45. And that's actually using their MLI Select program. So, all in all, this turned out way better because we actually ended up having no money left in the deal. Um, So, I'm, I'm not by any means upset at it, but you can kind of tell how, how unique it is. Like a 65 loan to value loan in most cases is like a kind of a bummer, you know, but in this situation, it actually ended up working well because the valuation was high enough that it would support the, the uh, e- despite the interest rates, it would go up. So we still got really good rents for the place. Now, the MLI Select program, and actually, this is another webinar we're going to be uh, aiming to do probably in the next few months. Uh, I actually have a contact with First National, and he's willing to come in and talk to us uh, collectively about CMHC financing, uh, especially when it comes to multifamily buildings. So I'd love to hear you guys' feedback if that's something you guys would like to take part in because he's extremely knowledgeable. And going through CMHC financing on these larger buildings, there's a couple of nuance items that you can do. So this MLI Select program, for example, we act, you know you can do one based on affordable housing, one on energy efficiency. I think there's there's another one or two categories that you fit into and depending on what level of let's say energy efficiency you can hit they will categorize you from like a it was this much this energy efficient prior to your renovation and now you've improved it by this much this qualifies you for 25 points or 50 points or whatever this threshold is each one of those points 
using this MLI select program actually gives you as the borrower additional benefits. So for example, in this property, we we're talking about potentially getting a 45 year amortized mortgage, which in the world of real estate investing is incredibly powerful because regardless if it's 40 or 45 years, we're gonna have to wait a long time to pay off this mortgage. I would prefer to have more cash flow now that I can then use and, and, you know, live off of if I needed to. So that's effectively, uh, you know, a little bit about the MLI Select program. But if you guys are interested, I'd love to hear your guys' comments on potentially, you know, uh, hearing more about the MLI Select program, more about CMHC financing and what that looks like for your guys' projects. But all in all, we still hit our target of 1700 bucks a month rent. We actually did a charge additional for parking. We actually have coin-op laundry, which we have these, like, um, you connect to them with your phones. And you can pay through this app, so we don't have to actually drive over there and collect change anymore which is people think that it's a uh, uh, people think that it's like such a, a novel idea to go to apartment buildings and collect loonies and it, it maybe is the first or second time and then you're like oh i gotta go collect the loonies before like they overflow anyway it's super handy not to have to do that <laughs> so um see uh george one sec we're almost wrapped up here i'll, I'll get to your question in just a, a hot second here so I think that this is actually our last slide. Exactly. So um, I do want to let you guys know that we have tons of opportunities constantly coming out uh, through the pipeline, uh, especially now we're approaching some properties in the U.S. We have private lending opportunities where if you just have stagnant money kind of sitting around and you're looking to secure that somewhere or make a little bit of extra interest rate, especially now during these uncertain times, not sure where the stock market's going to go. not sure, you know, where I should put my money. Should I buy real estate now? Should I not? So regardless, we do offer you know, interest rate opportunities for people that are looking to keep their money turning. So if that's something that interests you, please go on our website, reach out to us, give us your, your, you know, who you are, set up a call with us. And I'd love to have a quick one-on-one -on -one and see if maybe we would be a good fit. Okay. So once again, no pressure, but I think that there's some really good opportunities coming down the pipeline right now. And, uh, and I'd be excited to share a little bit more about that with all you. All right. So thank you guys so much. Um, I do want to open up the floor right now for some questions. And I saw here we have uh, uh, George, uh, what the gotchas in MLI Select uh, versus benefits. So uh, MLI Select is it's just a bonus program. It's an incentivization program that has come from uh, uh, CMHC. So CMHC has, has kind of put out there that you know, they're incentivizing developers, builders, uh, housing providers to accommodate potentially lower rents or more affordable, having a portion of their building allocated to more affordable rents. Uh, and by doing so, they will give you a discount on, on their fees. They will give you a higher amortization. They might shave off some of the interest just because it's going to be an insured mortgage. So the pros for you as the owner is that you can, um, you can utilize this to help you gain better financing. The cons are that you have to go through the motions of the requirements of the CMHC. And even then, sometimes if it doesn't exactly hit those uh, those thresholds, then it could be, you know, a little bit problematic in terms of maybe, maybe they just don't pass you. For example, we had to go through and do an energy audit and an energy audit. Like we got brand new windows. We have new boilers. We have new hot water tanks. We have new electrical led pot lights throughout the place. We've insulated everything. So you can imagine the energy efficiency of the building has gone up substantially compared to when we had originally bought it. So we had to hire a professional engineer to come through the building, do an entire simulation of the building to ensure that what we had done actually met that threshold. Now, imagine if we hired the engineer, you know, costs about eight grand to do one of these simulations and the simulation comes back and you don't hit that number, then you're not going to get the MLI select benefits and you just paid eight grand for a um you know, for a energy audit. Now, more often than not, the engineers kind of have a pre-consult with you. They let you know, hey, this is kind of what we think. This is what you might run into, yada, yada. But all in all, it's a, it's a pretty 
uh, pretty obvious if you're going to meet a certain, at least the minimum threshold. And if you're meeting at least the minimum threshold, then I would say that it's worth it to go through that. But definitely something to check out if you have looked into buying larger multifamily properties, because, um, you know, financing right now is is the number one question people have. How do I get better financing? How do I do, um, you know, how do I afford these or debt service these properties properly? So I hope that answers your question there. Any other uh, any other questions in the chat? Um, okay, so we have a question here. Can you comment on how an apartment burr differs from a residential burr or a duplex or a small burr for the investor? Okay, great question. Thanks, Adrian. Um, the I'd say that the biggest difference is actually not in the Okay, yes, there's more work involved. I would say that you might need a little bit more experience doing an apartment building than you would a smaller property. However, the biggest difference is just the cost. If you imagine a duplex, let's say it's 50000 a unit or $60,000 a unit, you can extrapolate that across 10 units or 20 units, I, th I think, at least anyway. Um, and you might have some savings, you know, if you have... Uh, you know, uh, consistency across an, a larger number between your sub trades. But I would say that the biggest difference is commercial properties do have a few different nuances. Like, for example, um, when I go and apply for a burr in a residential property, I'm dealing with the building department. It's under Section 9 of the building code. So the building department has certain requirements that now if I exceed two units in a building, if I go from two to three, for example, I no longer have that that plan or that building permit application reviewed by the building department. I now go to the engineering department because now it's considered uh, under a different subcategory. So, for example, we're actually going through permits right now to legally triplex a property. Now, this property has acted as a triplex for <coughs> excuse me. I don't know how long it's been a triplex, it's always been a triplex. It looks like a triplex. It's like a unique kind of shaped square building in the middle of the heart of Hamilton. But because we're going through the building department or the engineering department, they're asking for all kinds of things. So now we have to do a separate HVAC design. We have to do a separate plumbing design. We now have to, a furnace in a residential suite can only uh, supply air to two units. So the third unit now needs separate HVAC. So it needs separate air handling. So we have to do like a split unit. So there are these slight nuances that come into play. Um, but overall, I think it's just like, uh, like your problems just cost more money. I think that's the, probably the biggest, biggest answer. But I think that as long as you, um, as long as you kind of understand the basics and you have good sub trades that'll kind of help you and are experienced, then, uh, then you, you'll be okay as long as you've counted for the budget. And uh, this follow up here is comment. On, uh, can you comment on how the expected returns may differ between the two? That's a good question as well. I think that. It, um, there's one fundamental in real estate investing that I've always stuck by, and I'm happy I've stuck by it. And I think that especially right now, it's all the more true, is that you make your money on the buy. I know all too many people who have gotten into real estate, and they're eager, and especially now where property values are a little bit inflated. You know, they've come down a little bit, but we're not sure. Are they going to drop further? Where's the interest going? I think that that's one very important thing to consider with all of this is that you can have um, good, good returns on either property. I think your appreciation is going to be a lot less on a multifamily from a year to year standpoint than it would be on, let's say, a duplex, which is considered more residential. It's more affordable for the average person. More people can get into that market. So there's a higher chance that someone will want to buy that property. Hence, those smaller properties appreciate quicker. However, I, I'm at a point right now personally and in our business where we would prefer consistency over appreciate like such quick appreciation. We're happy with steady appreciation. We're happy with steady cash flow. We like having a brand new building that's gonna ideally have low maintenance costs. I'm gonna knock on wood to make sure that you know no lightning bolt comes crashing through this window <laughs> behind me. But anyway, um, I think that's kind of your biggest difference uh, when you're looking at the buildings. I would suggest, though, I don't know what your experience level is. At the end of the day, I think that you, uh, you know, work your way up to an apartment building. And then even with apartments, you make your money on the buy. 
make sure you get it for the right price and then see what you can do with it. Because remember, every property has a highest and best use. We could have likely just done an internal renovation and converted it back to a, uh, or like refurbished the student rental that we had. I'm not sure if that would have been the best return, but what it allowed us to do, it probably would have been a lot simpler as a renovation. I can tell you that for sure by a couple hundred thousand. Um, what it probably wouldn't have done is helped us destigmatize this property. It would have constantly been an issue with us trying to rent it. And the second you get one bad apple in a building like this, you scare away any of the good tenants. And so for that, it was worth it for us to do something so drastic that it completely changed the whole idea of this building. And for that, I we made the right call. I stand by that even now after having gone through it. But that's a, hopefully that's a, a decent enough answer for you there, Adrian. All right. Anybody else with any sort of follow-up questions? Now, I know maybe something doesn't come to mind just yet, um, but I, I do encourage everybody. My, uh, I'm still sharing my screen here. I see my email is here, or you can visit us, as I said, palpropertysolutions.com. Uh, reach out to us. Let me know if you want to have a one-on-one. -on -one. I'm happy to even just have a coffee, even if you're not ready to buy or whatever. You just want to have a chat and see what you can do or see what the future has in store. I'm, uh, I'm more than happy to connect with like-minded folks that find real estate fascinating like I do. All right. So thank you guys so much for, uh, for leaning into me a little bit here on your Tuesday evening. I know time is precious. And, uh, and if you guys, as I said, have any questions, please feel free to reach out. And uh, I look forward to connecting with each of you guys one-on-one. -on -one. Okay. Have a good night.